I want, um, moving slightly uh, beyond the, the waste and proliferation concerns, I want to get back to this question of cost, uh, which is an interesting one. Obviously, there are many carbon-free technologies out there, and it's a question of, in, with limited resources, uh, where can we best uh, direct our efforts? Uh, so I, I guess I'll ask you first, Dr. Uh, Makijai, uh, are there, w what's the best way to get a handle on how nuclear compares when you tally up uh, all the concerns? Because you also mentioned uh, wind and solar would need uh, some sort of national smart grid, which seems like it should be included in the cost. So is there a way to sort of fairly account for uh, you know, the cost of nuclear versus wind, solar versus efficiency versus other yes. uh, sources? Well, it's not all versus versus versus. Okay. See, uh, the, the, the choice is, are we going to do business in the centralized ele electricity generation way and leave the consumption end uh, in a sort of almost a technical anarchic mode have no rules for developers, anybody can do whatever they want, and we go on supplying the electrons whenever anybody flips the switch. We need a smart grid to do the cheapest thing that there is today, efficiency. And this morning's hearing in the, in the Senate Energy Committee, uh, there was a lot of discussion about that. The smart grid is not part of a renewable energy system alone. I'll give you an example. The average house has 58,000 BTU per square foot per year. Hanover House in New Hampshire, which was built efficiently, has an energy footprint for getting energy from the outside of 8,300 BTU per year. When you have that kind of energy footprint, and it is in President Obama's energy plan that there will be zero net energy houses by 2030. When you have that, you actually need a smart grid to manage those kinds of systems. Now, when you talk about cost, the cost of Wind energy, as I said, is coming down and uh, well, is, a, is lower than nuclear. It's about 8 to 10, 11 cents, depending on where you build the turbine. Uh, concentrating solar power is 11, 12, 13, 14 cents, depending on who you ask. 14 cents with storage. Uh, solar photovoltaics will cost you 20, 25 cents. Uh, Southern California Edison is doing a 250 megawatt project. Don't talk about Germany and solar. They're damp cloudy country. Let's talk about the United States, uh, where we have the Southwest. Time's up. Uh, Dr. Moore, do you want to respond about the, the point about costs and trying to get uh, some sort of sense of how we can account for the costs of, of each? In Germany, utilities are required by law to pay 50 euro cents per kilowatt hour for solar energy. That's approximately 75 cents US per kilowatt hour. That is ridiculous. Therefore, Solar energy has no place on the grid in terms of solar voltaics. My understanding of the solar thermal with the heated salts is that you only get about four hours of storage once the sun goes down. So it isn't a continuous form of power yet, and I don't know if it ever will be, because there's also clouds in the desert at times. In this zero carbon world, Dr. Makajani talks about using gas to back up the wind farms. That would mean the gas is running two-thirds of the time. In other words, providing the base load power for the country. That doesn't strike me as being a path to zero carbon. Uh, and, and, I, and I do not think you can coordinate the sun and wind like we have some magic wand. It isn't always blowing somewhere all the time. And the sun isn't always shining somewhere all the time. Sometimes there's no wind or sun. And we cannot possibly run the country on frozen meat, I would contend. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is Financing nuclear energy is very much like the compact fluorescent light bulb. People don't like paying five times as much for that light bulb. But the fact of the matter is, it lasts five times as long and only uses a quarter as much electricity and does pay for itself. Nuclear energy is the same. There's a, a hard pill to swallow at the beginning in terms of the capital cost. But once you have that plant in place, it runs far longer than any gas or coal plant will, up to 80 years and produces reasonably inexpensive electricity while it's doing so in terms of the cost of production. It pays for itself, whereas wind and solar either require major public subsidies or these renewable energy portfolios, which are basically state mandates requiring that utilities build more expensive electricity than they would otherwise build if they had a free choice to do so. Time's up. Uh, let's actually go one more round on this, so okay. if you want to respond to that. Yeah, the, you know, I didn't say the wind and sun could be coordinated so there'd be wind or sun all the time. I said one of the first things you need to do to reduce 
the amount of standby capacity you need is to optimize your wind and solar, then you have some storage associated at the consumer end with wind, and I gave you the ice energy example, I gave you two different examples of that, and molten salt storage. Well, I have news for you uh, regarding molten salt storage. The amount of heat that you can store in molten salt simply depends on your collector area. It has nothing to do with the molten salt itself. You can simply multiply the number of tanks in which you store the molten salt, and you can have molten salt storage for 10 hours or 15 hours. In fact, it is now being designed and contemplated, and I'm certain that plants will soon be built that will have 15-hour storage. Uh, so far as the natural gas piece of it is concerned, if you look at the diagram of the electric grid, and I'll be happy to present you a complimentary copy of my book, Dr. Moore, and, and I recommend it to you. That you, you. You'll see that there is a baseload component. In Sweden, for example, uh, a biomass combined heat and power plant was run for six years with very low emissions completely on renewable energy, and they even ran it on straw, which means, and they ran an advanced biomass plant, an integrated gasification power plant, in which you could actually capture the carbon dioxide in principle and inject it into the ground, which means you'd have a renewable source of energy, you'd have some base load, and there is some base load here, so that over the long term, you replace natural gas by biofuel you replace natural gas by biogas. You have combined heat and power and integrated gasification plants. So there's a whole scheme here that I think is worth studying. Thank you. Do you want to respond? I'll add. Well, what, one expert I would refer to is Vinod Kosla, who's the founder, one of the founders of Sun Microsystems, now the largest uh, investor in clean technologies in the United States, working out of Silicon Valley. He is very clear in his opinion on this, that we cannot simply get all of our electricity from biofuels or all of our transportation fuel from biofuels. They are going to remain niche players, at least until we can develop cellulosic ethanol. And even then, if you look at the amount of energy that we're consuming, and I agree with making the system more efficient, of course I do, and there are a lot of efficiencies that can be gained, but it's extremely expensive to retrofit buildings that have already been constructed. We can, we can much more easily make our new buildings more energy efficient than the ones we have now, but there is a long, period of time in terms of the turnover of infrastructure and trying to make a building like this more energy efficient is not a cheap thing to do. So there's, there's issues of economics here that we have to get our priorities right. And one of the things we have to look at is, you know, I, I noticed Dr. Makajani, as with many renewable energy proponents, talks about 5,000 megawatts of wind being installed. What that actually means is one third of 5,000 megawatts because those wind turbines are only working one third of the time. We should not be talking about installed capacity when it comes to intermittent energy forms. We should be talking about the actual production of electricity that is, that is coming from those machines. You put in a megawatt of solar, all you get is 200 kilowatts. You don't get a megawatt. So we, we need to remember that in terms of looking at the comparison of prices. Nuclear power plants on average are running over 90% of the time. Therefore, they are producing nearly their capacity. Up. 